Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar, the show about everything very north and very south. And uh, today we are um, back with, well, Henry, of course. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> how are you doing? Um, and uh, an, an interesting topic as usual. Um, today we want to talk about the largest seasonal event. What could that be? It could be cherry blossoms. But I would like to give the the question back to you. What do you think uh, might be the largest seasonal event? You mean in the world? okay? We we are we are in the context of the Arctic, correct? Of the poles, the poles. The okay, region. we're in 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 the context of the polar regions, and a seasonal event would be one that repeats every season, correct? Exactly. Yes. Well, knowing your preferences. Um, I would think it might have to do with the and and having seen some of the th some of the slides that we're looking at uh, going to look at, I would expect this to have to do with the formation of ice. That is absolutely correct. Um, we're talking there about ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we need to to put in a jingle like that. That's uh, perfect. Um, <laughs> Chris we, knows we, something. We are talking yeah. <laughs> We can also um, get um, listeners in there as well to actually uh, have some live interactive feedback, and then we can use uh, use that. Oh, as that, well. that would that would that would be fun. My infrastructure allows that now. I could I could honestly press a button and we'd be live on YouTube, uh, but we're not doing this right now. So um, yeah, uh, ice. <laughs> ice, ice, the largest seasonal event uh, in the world is actually the change from summer to winter in Antarctica. And why is that the largest seasonal event? Because when the ocean around Antarctica at the end of the summer starts cooling down and uh, reach a negative 1.7 degrees centigrade, then the ocean starts freezing over and we uh, have a formation of sea ice. And mm -hmm. you might have figured already that sea ice is kind of a very special um, thing and a very nice feature. It's very dear to my heart and it forms every year around Antarctica every year new we have a very very small portion that's multi-year eyes that's perennial that lasts over the summer and just grows thicker during winter next year and those tiny patches they are actually very localized um, in the uh, Weddell Sea in the Amundsen Sea um, off the Ellsworth uh, coast and um, we have very very small areas where the coastal areas still have that sea ice in summer. That means that during autumn, when it cools down, sea ice starts forming again. And then it, it starts growing um, from the coast into the ocean. And when we look at the sheer numbers, then you might get an idea why it's the largest seasonal event. During summer, we have roughly 3 million square kilometers on sea ice. So that's the, the small leftovers. Wait, wait, during 3 million time, is the... Sp 3 million is the small number. 3 million is the, is the small number. Okay. During winter time, it grows up to 18 million square kilometers. From 3 impressive. to 18 million. It grows every winter new. So it means the sea is freezing over, the Southern Ocean is freezing over to a large part. And it grows actually quite far from the coast into the Southern Ocean. The furthest extent is over a thousand kilometers away from the Antarctic coast towards wow. the Indian Ocean. That's a huge extent there what we're talking about. And we have a little video that shows that seasonal cycle. It's a couple of years old. So if, you, if you're listening to that podcast, just hop on over to YouTube and just have a look um, onto the video and you will see that we have a tiny little uh, clip in there from uh, the NASA scientific visualization studio and on the left side we have um, Antarctica on the right side we have the Arctic um, please focus on the left side you can see that during February March when we have summer there's almost no sea ice left in the waters you see very much that um, on the on the west of the uh, on the east of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula and the Weddell Sea, there is a big patch left of sea ice. Then we have a smaller part um, yeah, towards the Amundsen Sea, 
uh, where we have uh, Pine Island Glacier and uh, Thwaites Glacier, and that is also c- close to the uh, Ross Sea. Exactly, it's a massive ice area, and you can see between the southern tip of South America and South Africa, um, in the um, South Atlantic Ocean, we have a large area, but we have a much bigger area um, stretching into the uh, Indian Ocean, to the Pacific as well. So wherever we have the open ocean, where we have uh, the furthest uh, extent from the or f- furthest distance from the land masses, that's where the ice is growing. And uh, so, so let me co- let me ask you something. Um, we are, I mean, this is very very impressive to look at here. Um, how thick is that ice? Are we talking about a few centimeters, or is this really like a meter thick floats of ice so, that we're? So first year ice, it can get up to two meters. Is that's roughly the definition? It can In be thickness, a, a, okay. obviously, it can can it can get a little bit thicker. The actual thickness of the Antarctic sea ice is still a question of scientific debate because, as you see, it's a huge area, and as huge and large the area is, as inaccessible it is. So going into the sea ice is really a difficult thing to do in in the arctic you use the sea ice to build uh landing strips for for airplanes in antarctica that wouldn't be very wisely to do because if you have just one year old ice that grows during one season and just you know, melts down at the end of that season it can't get thick enough to actually carry those weights or maybe it can that's speculative that's really a <laughs> big you, question mark in science you don't want to test that exactly you don't want to try this yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly so there we have the major difference between the arctic and the antarctic sea ice in the arctic you see the arctic you can see that on the on the, on the video screen the arctic is an ocean basin um surrounded that's by land masses side, yeah. exactly and the Arctic land masses that surround the the ocean basin are just cooling that down. They are actually kind of an insulator, so they keep the ice um, alive inside the basin to some extent. So you see, in summer, in, in the Arctic summer, it melts down um, to a, a very small area lately um, as well, but it still lasts much longer, and it lasts on the ocean, while. In Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, you see Antarctica is the landmass surrounded by the Southern Ocean, and by that is also affected by the ocean circulation from the large um, oceans in the world. The, uh, the, the, the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, they all merge together in the Southern Ocean, so we have a much, much bigger impact there from warming waters during uh, the summer. And of course, then also the uh, larger uh, impact there um, in, in, in terms of cooling during winter. And by that, you can see why we have such a huge meltdown every spring and such a large growing during um, autumn, yeah, when it starts getting colder. That's a pretty amazing uh, feature, and it's very, very important for the ecosystems because a lot of... Um, of wildlife is closely connected to that seasonal event. The formation of sea ice gives the possibility for phytoplankton to grow under the ice. We have um, zooplankton that feeds from microplankton, uh, from, from uh, phytoplankton. We have then, of course, the food chain that feeds on the zooplankton. You see, the wildlife-rich waters in Antarctica, one of the reasons why it's so um, yeah, so adored by wildlife uh, experts is exactly why, uh, due to that um, huge event, the formation of that sea ice, but also the breakup of the sea ice every summer. It's a huge part of that journey of, let's see, marine mammals, for example, yeah, whales, seals. There's a huge, huge part um, connected to that as well. So it's a, a really um, impressive event. And we also have a video from the Australian Antarctic Division, Australia um, quite close to um, Antarctica. And the footage actually 
gives us a little impression how that sea ice looks like. We follow the icebreaker going through it. Um, we have some data on it. Um, that data is from 2018. So it shows that um, 2018 was actually um, a new record low on the extent of the sea ice. We know that kind of number from the Arctic, where we have our constantly record numbers of the shrinking sea ice um, area. And we had for quite some time actually uh, opposite trend in Antarctica, where the sea ice was growing from the size, from the area it span. While now, since 2014, 2016, that trend has reversed. So we have actually um, a declining area there as well. And that decline actually happens on a much, much larger scale in uh, as in the Arctic. So we know how difficult it is um, in the Arctic. We know, we talked many times about the decline of uh, sea ice area in volume in the Arctic Ocean. In Antarctica, that's much, much larger, larger in extent. That's just given the, the, the fact that we have such a huge area that's affected. So 18 million square kilometers. Just have a look at the ice cover the permanent ice cover of Antarctica, which is roughly 14 million square kilometers on the land. So that's the two ice sheets, the East and the West Antarctic ice sheet. And then you have the winter event, the formation of sea ice with 18 million square kilometers additional ice cover. It doubles, it more than doubles every winter. That's just an incredible number. It's crazy. It is indeed. So why do we have had this um, kind of special uh, opposite trend where the Ar uh, Arctic sea ice was uh, shrinking and the Antarctic sea ice was growing? There has been a lot of debate out there and especially climate skeptics were constantly using that as an example that climate change is not real or is still uh, debatable. The effects actually are very little researched because, of course, the winter Antarctic continent is very difficult to access. So, executing research in Antarctica during the Antarctic winter season, very, very difficult. It's not only pitch black, it's not only cold. We have wind speeds, incredible wind speeds down there. We're facing temperatures down to 90, a negative 90 degrees centigrade. That's incredibly cold, combined with a wind chill even worse. We have almost no accessibility. We, we basically don't really have a, a possibility to land somewhere. So we actually have to air travel there. You have to fly stuff in. You have to insulate that. All that makes it very difficult to execute research. And the research we have obviously is situated on either on the ice sheet itself or on shelf ice, which moves on a certain extent, because the glaciers are, um, are yeah, just moving forward. But it's not so much affected by the seasonal events as the sea ice is. So the sea ice, when it just completely breaks down uh, in spring, the shelf ice still is intact. And that's the reason why um, a number of scientific research stations are there. The effect that actually um, exhilarated the extend the the growing of the sea ice extent um during summer uh, during winter was mainly postulated because of uh, growing wind activity around the southern ocean so the reason why we have such a huge area around antarctica that grows is not that the ocean gets tremendously colder in fact the ocean is getting warmer but we have winds forming on the continent and you basically have no landmass that um, cuts down the Antarctic circumpolar current. That current is wind driven. So that means we have strong winds on the ocean and that chills down the surface of the ocean to enough cold that the sea water, the salt water actually can freeze over. And that by that <laughs> also extend that area. Indeed, it's amazing. Another factor that comes in is uh, the still existing and currently growing ozone hole um, on top of Antarctica. So we still have 
the uh, ozone hole there. We have an Arctic ozone hole, which actually just gets smaller and it disappeared for some years. It's back there again, but the Antarctic ozone hole still is very prominent. And that affects actually the circulation of uh, winds in the atmosphere quite a lot. It chills down the Antarctic continent quite a lot. And by that makes the sea ice grow um, against the trend of a warming ocean. And that is pretty spectacular what kind of force wind actually can unfold against a warming ocean. Pretty, pretty spectacular. I'm... Do we? I'm speechless. <laughs> we, 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 we have another map to show um, that you brought with you, which um, shows you uh, sh shows us the concentration now and uh, and the years before. I think on the left side, the the red line shows the uh, ice edge up to 2010. Yeah, that's the average uh, between 81 and 2010. So um, we we take the sea ice extent of each year and um, give it an average number. So we, we just take them together and we just find right. where's the average between those 19 years. And we see the white colored area around Antarctica that the maximum extent for September 2020. So a few months uh, back, that was the maximum extent when we have the um, Arctic uh, autumn, when it starts to form new sea ice. When we have the minimum extent in the Arctic, we have the maximum extent in Antarctica because that's when the winter ends and we slowly head towards spring. And you can see we have a huge extent there. When you see the area stretching from the um, Ron Filtner shelf ice in the Weddell Sea, that's a huge area. And that shelf ice part of the habitat, for example, for emperor penguins, for Adelie penguins, that's where they breed, where they, um, they they breed on the shelf ices, but they need to cross over the sea ice to find food, to be able to um, hunt for food. And you can see that at some parts um, towards South Georgia, for example, the sea ice stretches quite a distance from, um, from the coastal areas. It almost reaches South Georgia a pretty amazing factor. We have some different patterns of Antarctic and Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice um, melts from both the top surface but also from the bottom. And Arctic sea ice, however, mainly melts from the bottom because the top largely is covered in snow, which insulates the top, so we find almost no uh, melt ponds on Antarctic sea ice. It's only the warming ocean that melts it down and that makes that effect so much more spectacular when you see what kind of force the wind unfolds to create the sea ice and then the warming ocean in spring just breaks up the same amount again so it's really just a spectacular event we can see here it's really great to see how much force mother nature unfolds every year on a new scale it's really impressive i am impressed I definitely am <laughs> impressed. <laughs> um, okay, anything else that we can see from those maps? The right-hand side says that there's an anomaly, which does that mean that's part where, okay, we can see parts that are bigger and parts that are smaller than... Yeah, we, we see the on, the, on the right side, the, years. the anomaly so, uh, shows where we have a growing sea ice extent right. um, as an anomaly to the average, and the red areas are uh, just uh, indicating where we lose um, sea ice and we lose actually okay. more sea ice even though we have more blue stretches but in um, in in the area in the extent area that's smaller than the red uh, stretches mm -hmm. so we actually lose quite a lot um, currently but again we are talking here about seasonal uh, sea ice it's first year sea ice it's not growing very thick so it has a very big impact on the whole ecosystem in the southern ocean it's pretty important for the whole climate system of the planet a pretty amazing piece of nature we can face it. it's it's so interesting the all the factors that go into into that ice growing and into and it disappearing again it's just 
Yeah. It's, and then it's... we had this news. I think you you forwarded that last week to me, where this um this this history capsule was um found in. <laughs> In uh, Ireland, wasn't it? Uh, a time capsule. Someone, someone a time buried capsule, yes. a time capsule in a glacier in Iceland, and uh, w with a time capsule, you would expect that to last for I don't know, fifty, hundred, couple of hundred years until someone finds it, and then you have stuff in there from the current times, and it's uh, it's cool to see. And we we know these time capsules from like some somewhere added to buildings, to the foundations of buildings, and these kind of things, hundred years ago. And uh, this one didn't make it that long. I was talking about the one um, uh, you forwarded, forwarded me the article about uh, one that was actually put on the North Pole. Oh, that from one. A yeah, that's icebreaker. right. That's right. But again, that, that should have just... been in there for such a long time. But it it ended up being in there for how long? Two years. For two years, exactly. That yeah. was put in 2018 um, at the North Pole uh, by a Russian icebreaker uh, brought tourists there. <laughs> And this year, it just got uh, discovered at a beach in uh, in Ireland, and the yeah. people were really surprised about the <laughs> um, about the about the contents, Russian content, uh, Russian tax and maps, and yeah. it shows you how flexible sea ice actually is. So we have a huge drift of the sea ice um, yeah. in both Arctic and Antarctic. We have actually a higher velocity in the Antarctic because you don't have any land masses that borders the ocean. So the ice can actually travel quite far. When it breaks up and we have strong enough winds, the sea ice can travel further north than any other ice form, uh, any other, other sea ice um, on the planet. So we have actually uh, in the Arctic Ocean um, moments when the sea ice goes down to South Greenland. However, because there is nothing that stops, uh, no landmass that actually stops the sea ice in the south, they can travel further north and the sea ice from the north traveled south. Pretty amazing. Um, it's not really an indicator, though, the time capsule, um, about the yeah, the survival rate of, of the Arctic sea ice, because it doesn't really tell you, uh, tells you or it doesn't give you uh, a comparison data how much longer it would have um, taken a few years back when the ice was thicker and uh, less easy um, to be pushed by the uh, by by the um, wind currents, right? That's I mean that's that's pretty much the scientific method. You need a control. You need something that that shows you what the average is, that shows you what the normal case is, and then um, yeah. So it doesn't really tell us much, but it's still something that just feels like it, it should have stayed a bit longer up at the North Pole, right? It's just it's just a Indeed. gut feeling at this point. Yeah. But that's actually uh, one of the major reasons why, for example, the uh, one-year-long um, expedition Mosaic um, by Alfred Wegener Institute um, was just freezing the polar stern icebreaker into uh, the Arctic sea ice to actually gather year-round data on sea ice. How yes. actually does it really develop? How does it look like? What's what's its pattern in winter? What How does it really look like, feel like? And what's the scientific mm. Um, importance there. I wish that we could execute a similar project in Antarctica, that we have actually the chance to let an icebreaker freeze into the sea ice, travel with the sea ice, but execute some field research down there. Much, much more difficult, as I said many times, it's only first year old sea ice, much more difficult to um, work on the ice itself, which was a significant part of the research of Mosaic Expedition. But it would be reveal. It would reveal a lot of scientific background data we don't have at the moment. All right, um, Antarctic sea ice. It's it, yeah. I, I love these kind of things. So much to learn. Um, so now we get to the point in this show that uh, will be unfamiliar to most people because we are adding a new segment and that segment is our picks of the week. So uh, the the background is that um, there are things we come across during the week that are interesting to us that um, they might have a relation, a context uh, of the Arctic, Antarctic or not. And I... Um, I think it's nice to have kind of a bit of an insight in what moves us apart from the main topic of this show. So uh, from now on, we're going to try, no promise that we will do it every time, but we'll, we're going to try to have a little Picks of the Week segment at the end. 
and uh, uh, I believe mine is not quite uh, quite <laughs> polar related. <laughs> yours is yours is for sure. Um, so let me uh, start with mine, and that is um, completely self-serving thing i'm doing here i'm showing you a project that i've been working on for 10 years and it is a camera and it's a pinhole camera so the for the non-photographers among you just a quick explanation a pinhole camera is a camera that um captures light not through a lens but through a very tiny hole and it's 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 the oldest form of camera uh, that the, that mankind knows and those uh, cameras come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And 10 years ago, I started a project together with a friend who is a wood uh, worker, who's a uh, cabinet maker. Um, and uh, we got a lot of like German craftspeople on board and out came the MIP, the Marquardt International Pinhole, which um, there's a bit of a project documentation on the website. We'll put a link in the show notes. And uh uh, back in 2014, we finally sold 10 limited, hand-signed, uh, very exclusive cameras um, made with different kinds of woods and with a very elaborate uh, attachment system for the film and stuff like that. So that is um, that has been dormant for quite a while, but now we have more... Um, more of the of the metal pieces everything is custom so that's kind of the difficult part here everything's custom and we have uh added new um metal pieces and we have now finished making another well bunch of cameras and uh we are still finishing up all the all the final things tying together all the different strings and uh at one point in the not too distant future um we'll have cameras for sale which i'm enormously proud of because that's really a project that a lot of work and uh, a lot of uh heart and sweat have gone into and <laughs> so yeah that's the market international pinhole we'll put a link in the show notes in case that is something that you might be interested in um pretty amazing piece of craftsmanship really uh great i, I really so, like and, it and, and 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 it really brings together like a, a woodworker with like really interesting kinds of different woods. Every camera is a one of a kind. Uh, it brings together a master craftsmen from a, from the metal side because those pieces need to be, I mean, had to be designed and be made and be anodized and be polished and be whatever. Then there's the assembly. There's a there's a leather worker involved here who made the attachment strap. So the combination of wood and leather and aluminum is it's just a very nice even even just as a ob, as an object is a very nice object to touch. And uh, then you can take photos with it. I mean, here's here's an example of a, of what a photo out of that looks like. Um, it's pinholes have an interesting way they work with sharpness in the photo where like normally the foreground would be out of focus or the background would be out of focus that you'd have to make a choice and with a pinhole camera you can get this in infinite depth of field what we call it which is yeah it's something that um, I'm really proud of I'm really really proud of and that it and it's going back to the roots. You don't have a LCD screen where you can check your uh, your <laughs> settings the, or your frame. It's the really archetype of a camera. It. Yes, exactly. It's the archetype. It's the the it's it distills the camera down to the, its essentials, and it does that in a nice package. So, um, you have another. Uh, nice. You have a thing too that you just um, released. You <laughs> people might remember that we had a bit of a break in the show for a few weeks a while ago. And one of the reasons was, or the main reason was that you were out working. What were you working exactly. on? Exactly. I was working on a documentary um, in Iceland. It was a very spontaneous project. I, I'm, I'm really glad that it popped up. And it brought me back to Iceland um, in, yeah, in midst of uh, the COVID times. And the documentary is going to be screened or premiered tomorrow in uh, German television. It's in German, um, but it uh, yeah presents the east fjords the eastern re uh, region of um of iceland which is the dense uh, the the least densely populated area it's also home to the heart of europe's largest glacier uh what no you're good it's um a pretty amazing place it covers a number of protagonists of of people that live and work in the area like 
um, Kali, uh, who is a fish um, a fisherman who has a, a little fish factory there, produces dried fish, but also um, haukat, which is um, fermented shark, uh, kind of a, a speciality in, in, in Iceland. Um, we have um, Brindis, who, who is talking to, to elves and uh, hidden people. Um, <laughs> We have Dotti who breeds um, horses, and so on. A number of people. We have one of the um, yeah, most important glaciologists in in Iceland, um, uh, Rapildu Hannesdottir, in there, who talks a bit about the effects of climate change on Vatnajökull glacier. So it's a pretty amazing piece. Four to five minutes. I'm I'm really happy. It was a great team. It was really beautiful. Um, they didn't lose any faith, um, even though they needed to stay in quarantine. Um, they needed to do two uh, it's COVID tough tests. Production. And it's a tough production right now, right? It's really difficult. It is. To it is. It's, it's very different from, from what we were used to. Um, but the team was small, was very, very dedicated, very passionate, and was just amazing to see um, everything coming together. And I'm surprised how fast everything uh, went. We didn't expect that to be, and now it's like um, exactly the time on Thursday, the 19th of November, at uh, quarter past eight in the evening, this one will be uh, aired on um, the Northern um, uh, Public Broadcaster, NDR, the NDR in Germany. Yes. <clears throat> exactly. So, and uh, we put a link in the show notes. Pretty, yeah. pretty. Um, I'm pretty happy to see that coming to life now. Oh, the, the preview, as we've just seen, is, is, is already very, very promising. And having been to Iceland myself a couple of times, it's, yeah, it, it, it wakes up memories. It brings back a lot of interesting and, f and fun memories. And um, may I say, sir, you are doing interesting stuff there. I mean, this is really, <laughs> really cool. I'm very impressed. Um, so, uh, yeah. That will be in the show notes. It's in German, but maybe just watch it anyway, because you know Henry was part of it. So, um. and I just might uh, pursue the uh, production house to add some subtitles in English uh, to make it accessible for non-German I mean, speakers as well. Yeah, it's, I think it's worth it. And uh, a forty-five minute documentary about the east of Iceland. Indeed. All right, I guess that covers it for today. Um, we're at the end of this episode. Thanks, everyone, for your time, for joining in, for listening, for watching. If you haven't watched it, you missed a few things today. So there's a link in the show notes if you want to watch this. Um, we are at curiouslypolar.com. That's our main uh, place for, for, for all the episodes of this. Um, we're, of course, on YouTube with our videos. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Curiously Polar there. And... Uh, yeah, we're looking forward to interacting with you. Send us questions. Send us feedback. Let us know what you think. And um, that's it for today. Until next week, take care and bye-bye.